pending part b okay so we continue with our uh, previous discussion we had to be left uh, this was our last slide so uh, we will be talking about the boundary conditions and the determinancy okay so it tells us about that uh, uh, basically what's a statically you already know from the solid mechanics what's a statically determinate structure and what is a statically indeterminate structure okay uh, basically you can easily figure it out from uh, trusses so like uh, it's telling us about number of at life boundary conditions can be defined mathematically uh, and you know what's a statically determinate structure is basically uh, the number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns okay and a statically indeterminate structure is basically uh, what it tells us that the number of equations and the number of un unknowns are not equal but the number of unknowns are more than the number of the equations regardless of the fact it is a, a 2d structure or a 3d structure okay so boundary conditions provided provides additional equations of uh, uh, constraints so if there are fewer constraints then the minimum required the structure is under constraint and unstable if there are more constraints then the minimum it's very important thing so if there are fewer constraints then the minimum required for example if you have uh, for a simply supported beam you need a, a, a pin and a roller for, but for it if, if we just uh, place uh, only a pin so you, our structure will be basically under constraint and what it will result it will result in instability it will result in instability and uh, the uh, 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 stability will be at stake if there are more constraints than the minimum required then it means that structure is over constrained that means for the simply supported beam instead of using a pin and a roller we place uh, uh, two pins instead of one replacing it with a roller so the structure will become an over constrained structure so we want the structure to be statically perfectly determinate so if uh, the structure is statically indeterminate if there are fewer independent equations available then unknown to solve uh, respectively uh, so the structure becomes a statically indeterminate structure so, uh, so okay he is telling us about uh, uh, that the, in case of trusses the degree of indeterminacy can be easily be found by i is equals to m plus r minus 2j so what this i and what this m and r and 2j stands for m means the total number of uh, uh, total number of members is m the total number of members of the of the truss okay and uh, then what do you know r r means the total number of unknown boundary conditions is r j is the total number of joints placed where uh, every truss member is connected and uh, the result i will determine it whether your truss is a statically determinate truss or it's a statically indeterminate truss so if i is equals to 0 uh, the truss is determined as statically determinate but if the value of i becomes greater than or equal to 0 the truss is statically indeterminate okay so you have to watch out whether uh, the result is e zero or it's coming out to be a value one two three any value comes out to be that it can be considered as an indeterminate stress uh, truss okay Okay, so now we have got a, a common boundary conditions uh, telling you that uh, you might have studied all these things if I am not uh, mistaken in your st first year statics. The prime or dash symbol indicates differentiation with respect to the spatial coordinates that is A, gradient or slope. Okay, so uh, uh, for the names, like if you got a fixed, uh, fixed clamp, uh, fixed support regardless if it's 2d or 3d uh, it will give you translation constraints will be u v and w will be equals to 0 and the rotation constraints u dash v dash w dash will be equal to 0 also 
it means that there will be uh, no translation along x, y and z and there will be no movement or rotations about the x, y and z axis. It means the system is fully constrained. So translation constraints and rotation constraints. Then we go to ball and socket, the swivel, 3D structures, very common uh, uh, ball and socket joint. Uh, so it will give you, again the translation constraint will be u, v and w, they will be equal to 0. And uh, the rotation constraints, because it's a ball and socket, uh, it will be uh, giving you all degrees of freedom in a ball and socket, so it's saying none. Okay, now let's say if you go to a pin structure, okay, for a pin structure, he's specifically telling you about uh, 2D and here he's telling you about the ball and socket joint is a 3D and for a fixed clamp, it is can be 2D or 3D, okay. Uh, so, for a 2D, uh, it will be no translation, which means uh, u equal to v equal to 0, okay. Uh, you, you can consider it as an example of uh, uh, your door uh, hinge, this example, but it can uh, rotate about the z-axis. Uh, and uh, if we go for a roller, which is two-dimensional, you already know roller will be a, a, what it will be no translation perpendicular to the roller surface but along the y-axis which means u will not be u is not equal to zero but v equal to zero and there will be rotation constraints there will be none rotation constraints in case of a, a roller okay so uh, here is telling you about this is a pin connection is showing you is a, ro a roller these small uh, wheels are there in a roller Roller connection, pin connection, fixed connection, and this is the ball and socket. He is telling you about the ball and socket. And then uh, he is telling you, I am showing you real pictures of structures. Example of a real boundary conditions can be seen in the pin joint in the truss shown. Okay. You can see here the, there are pin joints being constrained over there. These pin and basically it is a triangular truss structure. Again a triangular truss structure, three dimensional triangular truss structure. And uh, here it, you can see it is being uh, constrained by to, to a some sort of a column, and this is a pin. So pin joint interest and uh, A and B is showing you the details. All right. So now he says statically determinate or indeterminate you have to decide uh, whether the truss uh, are statically determinate or indeterminate if you look at the this truss okay. So the truss uh, first of all we look at the number of the uh, members of the truss that is very important to look at the number of the members of the truss. So the number of the members of the truss uh, is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we go to R and what is R is the total number of unknown uh, boundary conditions. Okay, so unknown boundary conditions is if you look there is a pin over here and the roller will be here. So number of un, uh, 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 constraints the pin will provide will be along the X and Y is 2 and the roller will be along the Y. So 2 plus 1 so R will be equals to 3 minus 2 and what is J? J is the total number of joints for this uh, structure. So it, the formula, remember the formula was I is equals to M plus R minus 2J. So I is equals to M plus R minus 2J and uh, J comes out to be equals to for the joints 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 4. So you simplify the expression and you get I is equals to 0. So what does this tell us? this expression that uh, this truss member is a statically determinate structure okay so if you want to look we can have another structure also uh, which can be the same truss we have but we add another diagonal along it so if you look at it this now uh, the total number of members will be 1 2 3 4 5 6 so it will be 6 uh, the number of boundary conditions still remains the same and uh, the joints still remains the same 4 to 4 
but now when we solve it, uh, so what uh, we're getting it as equals to, uh, we get it as one after the solution. So this was nine minus eight comes out to be equals to one, and we have left with one, and we know. Remember the condition of the miracle. He says that uh, if i is greater than or equal to zero, the truss is statically indeterminate. So we can say that this truss is statically indeterminate. Now, uh, so you have learned in this class that uh, if a truss structure is given to you, you can easily predict by using this formula i is equal to m plus r minus 2j that uh, truss is going to be statically indeterminate. Or it's going to be statically indeterminate. So characteristic tasks in structural analysis. Structural analysis supports the structural design and uh, can uh, carry a lot of variety of tasks and understanding the complex response of the structures, specifically the resultant stress, strain, and displacement to the applied loads, which answer the question without again we go back to our remember the topic of the three S: the strength, the stiffness, and the stability. And uh, so the a sample of such tasks is uh, given below. And uh, what he is telling you about is number one. Uh, it's a load analysis. We have strength analysis. We have stiffness analysis. Relational frequency analysis. Dynamic response. These are all the list of modeling analysis which you can easily do uh, some of topics could be done analytically uh, using simple uh, equations and uh, uh, remember the equilibrium equations the constant group equations and the panoramatic equations that I've shown you in my first lecture that they are, they are very important so you can easily do that uh, for simple uh, Boundary conditions for complex boundary conditions, all these analysis can be performed in a general uh, purpose finite element analysis software like uh, ANSYS, STAD, or ALGO, or NASPRA, and you can do it in any, any of them, like LS Diana, all these softwares are excellent, very good uh, finite element general uh, purpose softwares. So we go to another topic here, the method of uh, the certainly a subtopic of modeling and uh, structural analysis consists of three fundamental parts, uh, consider forces, movements and the application of rotating mechanics, okay, uh, including the potential and kinetic energies of the application of Langlarge's mechanics in stress. So if, if the body is in global equilibrium, the, uh, every local particle of the body will be in equilibrium simple definition of equilibrium. So equilibrium implies negligible acceleration which means yes inertial forces will be uh, zero and hence implies static analysis. So dynamic analysis considers the motion of body uh, and we will assume that a body is rigid okay requiring. So uh, methods of structural analysis Uh, we consider, uh, well, if you look at it, uh, it's the same thing as, as this one. This is the same as this. Okay. So one say one is uh, is equilibrium, the other is deformation, and uh, here we consider the geometry. Uh, in deformation, what we consider is the deformation, uh, uh, geometry of the material particle, displacements, and the concept of strain. Because when deformation is there, strain, strain, you know, is the change in length. Change in length per unit original length is basically the strain. Okay. Uh, the any material is continuous, and again, uh, strain we are always considering the material has to be continuous, which means there is no hole or void or any type of uh, discontinuity or any cracks or any arches in those structures. Okay. Uh, with uh, because then our uh, Hooke's law will not be valid on that. That's the reason. We further assume the uh, text that uh, deformations are small enough. That only again the same logic because we are within the we are not going in the yielding zone, so the linear elastic uh, limit is, has to be applied the proportional limits. Then we go to the constitution, and remember uh, in my first class I told you the equations, the constitutive equations. So for here the, for the structural analysis, the constitution is 
the stress and the strain are dual quantities that are intimately related within a given material structural system and what is that material it is the modulus of elasticity because every modulus of elasticity for every material for whether it's steel uh, it's uh, aluminium copper brass e will be different these are the stress relations okay okay so the method of structural analysis and mathematical analysis and uh, after you have structural analysis are mathematical analysis then you have got another which are experimental analysis so mathematical analysis results in uh, close form solutions remember the analytical solution is the best solution if you have three solutions to obtain and if you are able to solve or get a mathematical analysis or analytical solution of that problem that will be the most accurate and the best one you must always remember because it's a close form solutions series solutions you can have series solutions as in pneumatic solutions numerical solutions etc so uh, two major approaches for from mathematical analysis are newtonian or vector mechanics and the lagrangian or scalar mechanics problems okay just you, uh, you have to understand a little bit of it what i'm saying and uh, for the, for the experimental okay uh, the center tool used uh, in newtonian analysis for the arthur free body diagram which are used to account for all forces and moments when applying newtonian law so experimental analysis involves at the testing of uh, real or prototypical structures and uh, to measure the strains or uh, deformations we use various techniques but uh, for your uh, third year and final year we will be dealing with them a lot it will be the strain gauges you can have optical interferometers we will not be dealing with that and extensometers perhaps uh, if i am not wrong uh, you might have already used extensometers in your uh, first year for mechanics one uh, practicals the teacher and when you when you have uh, visited the material testing lab you have the only on the, on the stress uh, material testing machine you have used uh, a sample you remember and you have used extensometer to find a deflection and then you would have drawn uh, i think the practical books the stress strain curve for your respective it might be aluminium i think and uh, ms materials stress strain curve okay okay so now we go to uh, uh beam beams are usually long uh, uh members they are straight and they are prismatic uh, they, uh that supports and their main function is basically to support the transfer loads which are loads that acts perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the member okay this is how would to define a beam loads on a beam now any loads whenever they are replaced on the beam and loads can be uh, concentrated force it can be surface forces it can be loading which is omega newton per meter so they are all loads they, they will what will do they will cause it to bend uh, uh, and by bending it means it means it means you want to flex they will be flexed as opposed to uh, there will be no stretching compressing or twisting so the loads cause the initial straight members to deform into a curve shape again if, if you have this beam and you apply this load and there is also a loading omega x is also there and this concentrated force p is acting so this is a transfer load applied to the beam and this what will it will happen that this beam which is fixed over here it from here it will go and go and it will go on the up side okay and uh, because the load concentration was there so it has caused it deflection to flex okay so and what is uh, basically this de deflection is basically this curve shape it is called as a deflection curve or it is called as the elastic curve so as a result of this it has undergone bending and uh, uh, very important pure bending what is a pure bending pure bending it means that uh, if there is no changes in the moment uh, on that beam as a result of loading it is understand we pure bending okay so here it is uh, uh, refers to flexure of beam in response to constant bending moment for example here if you look at it there is one force p and this p these are the constraints which is being applied so from a to b b to c and c to d if you look from b to c because there are two constant forces are there uh, the, the bending moment m is equals to p but uh, ea but there is no change in the bending moment 
what is happening to shear force is equal to zero. So you remember from your second year while when you were doing your developing uh, shear force and bending moment diagram. So in case of the uh, the, the pure bending, uh, 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 we will say that in case of uh, constant uh, bending moment m, uh, the region is said to be in pure bending. Why? Because the, the transfer shear force in case of pure bending v equals to zero, and you know. What was shear force equals to? It is rate of change of moment, uh, uh, dm over dx. Okay, if it is changing dm over dx is basically uh, the shear force. So if basically uh, you know already that uh, your m is a constant, so it means that uh, dm over dx equals to zero because there is no change in the bending moment. So if dm over dx equals to zero, it will make uh, v equal to zero. So if uh, v equals to zero, then it the pure bending condition is being implied. And another proof for that is basically that for pure bending. It also imply that there will be no axial forces will be acting in the beam, which means uh, there is no force acting along the x-axis in in this direction, or along uh, the negative x-axis. Which means uh, because if the force would have been acting, then it will be uh, under a scenario of combined bending because axial forces would have come into being. Another important thing is that for pure bending, the neutral axis must pass through the centroid of the cross section so if pure bending is happening and if you assume this is this x axis is passing through the neutral axis then the centroidal axis the centroid of this section must also pass through the uh, must also pass through the uh, neutral axis but if if, uh, if there is a problem in which there is uh, not uh, uniform bending there is non uniform bending then these two equations will not hold which means v will not be equal to zero and uh, uh, this v is equal to dm over dx will also not be equal to, uh, which means this quantity dm dm over dx will also not be equal to zero under a uh, uh, non-uniform bending scenario. So now we go to another slide. 